All righty. I hope you guys are having a great weekend. I have as well. Um, we celebrated my wife's birthday. We're not going to say how old she is, but she's a couple years behind me. So you can, and I'm 70, going on 71. So we did that Wednesday, and Nathan was with us all day. So he was able to uh, make some cupcakes for the uh, grandma. And today, unfortunately, they decided to have the real party at Nathan's house, my daughter's home, that big house that you guys see in some of my drone videos. And we prepared a huge meal, gigantic pork chops stuffed, butterfly cut pork chops. They were like an inch and a half thick with some uh, apple and uh, bread stuffing type. Uh, and I think even cashews or something, some kind of nut in there, delicious. We buy them locally. We bought five of those monster chops. I bought two pounds each, I swear. Didn't get a chance to eat because, of course, as always, yeah, they're running on European time. I remember when I was little, we used to have dinner at nine. And, of course, the, 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 word, the word siesta means, you know, you take a nap after lunch. Yeah, that was very common back in the old days. When I lived in Puerto Rico, we were following the Spanish culture, of course. And uh, But anyway, so I had to leave early. They're going to bring me some food, hopefully. And by 7 o'clock-ish, when we you know sign off, I'll be able to have dinner. I made a delicious 
salad. It was amazing. I tasted it, actually gave it to my wife last night to give a, a little bit of a um, judging, if you will, and she said it was fantastic. So hopefully I will be able to enjoy some of that a little bit later. But anyway, let's go ahead and say hello. All 22 people that are in the chat here. Well, we got 24 on board. I don't think all of you are on the chat yet. There's a lot of you, though. Uh, again, as customary, we would like to know who you are, where you're from. What are you interested in? Are, are you an owner of a printer yet? Or are you thinking about getting one? Because we're going to be discussing that subject. I get this question quite often about how to choose a printer. And it's just as difficult as how to choose a car. I mean, you either are brand loyal or you're not. And, you, you know, if this is your first car, maybe it's the dream car of your life. Well, in our case, we have two basic brands to choose from because we do photo printing. We do not do office printing. A lot of you do, and you keep asking me about HP and Brother and all kinds of other non-photo printers. I have to kind of politely tell you that I have no idea what model you're talking about because exactly there are like hundreds of different models out there. So anyway, um, we're going to be discussing that as well. Let me pop up the page where I got some subjects here. So, and also we're going to talk about the proper way to troubleshoot printer issues. Okay. And then I'm going to open up the floor. We're going to also look at YouTube and see if there are any good questions. And one of them was actually a, well, officially a non-photo printer, one of the L series printers. Somebody bought one, set it up. Everything was fine until they tried to print a photo. I don't know whether this person had compared other printers' outputs, but apparently he is not at all satisfied with them. Now, I have never used one. I assume that they all use dye ink, so it would be comparable to, say, one of the uh, Epson photo dye ink printers, like the 1400, 1430, 50, and 1500. That type of printer uses dye-based inks. They produce great prints. So I don't know exactly what he's talking about, but we're going to go ahead and cover that as well. Now, what is today? Today is the 28th. So by next week, and I believe it's going to be, let's see, let me look at my calendar. Da, 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 da. Okay. So not next Saturday, not the 4th, but on the 11th, we're going to have Mike from Precision Colors again with us. I am also waiting to see if Mitch Bauer wants to join us. Again, he's going through some turmoil at this moment. So at this time, I should say, and uh, he hasn't even been creating any content for his channel. But anyway, Mike is going to discuss a treatment that he has been using not only to, to clean Canon printheads rather nicely and very, very effectively rather than the very passive way that we've been using you know, our Windex solution with the magic stuff right here. Uh, he's going to show us how to do that in a more powerful way, but also a way that will not harm the printhead, but will increase the effectiveness of what this fluid can do to dissolve ink away. And so that's going to be awesome. Also, on the 9th, okay, Mark that day down, folks. On the 9th, supposedly, Canon is going to announce, okay, what's going to replace the Pro 10 and the Pro 100. He told me this. So, again, we're just going to wait and see. Um, let me check. So, the 9th will be, yeah, it's going to be at least a week and a half from now. So we will save that uh, from when he comes on board um, on the second week of July. So that's going to be awesome. I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, what could they possibly add, right? They would have to replace the print hit with something different if they were going to add other colors, okay? Uh, they could adjust, I don't know, maybe get rid of one of the grays in the Pro 
100 and add, I don't know what, green, blue, I don't know, whatever. Or what I think they're going to do is probably add some sort of LCD screen. Uh, really, there's really nothing they're going to be able to add that's going to be that dramatic. Um, it's not going to be an internal user replaceable uh, wasting cartridge. That would be fantastic if they did that. That would solve the problems with, you know, when you're refilling, of course, and creating waste ink every time you exchange a cartridge or a full set of cartridges. If you're refilling with double full sets, yeah, that ink could be then diverted someplace else. But I don't think that's going to be the case. That's only a pipe dream in my eyeballs, you know, in my brain, I should say, not eyeballs. But you know what I mean. So pretend the same thing. What could they possibly add? You already have 10 colors. What else? Uh, it's not going to be a roll adapter. That's for darn sure. Maybe a firmware with longer paper length capabilities, possibly for both printers. Who knows? Um, some sellers out there like Red River are already offering 13 by longish type uh, papers. They're no longer just locked to 13 by 19. You could get some slightly, I mean, you could buy a roll and cut your own. Yeah. Who knows? We will see. We'll have to wait until the 9th of July. If you're curious, just I think if you search Canon Rumors, you might be able to find some information. I tried, but I really couldn't find anything very concise. So again, it's being kept quite secret. So we'll have to wait until July the 9th. Now, will I be buying one of those? Not right away, because again, what if it's just one of these printers that's going to be locked. I don't know what Canon is thinking at this point, but you know, who knows? That could that could very well be the case. It took, oh gosh, it took about two years for the Canon Pro 100 to be, you know, for the coding for the chips to be uh, figured out so that Red Setter could create a set of Chip resetters, same thing went for the Pro 10. So we don't know. But it's good news. I hope it's something really dramatic. And if it is, then, yeah, I would consider buying one. We'll see what kind of rebates these companies are you know, willing to offer. Uh, I think, and I got told by Mike a very interesting theory behind that, uh, behind that rebate reason. If you guys go back, if you... If you just started just a little while ago, then you have no clue what actually went on when that Pro 100 came out or originally. So you got to go back to Nikon and Canon DSLRs. So the Nikon, I forget the terminology. Maybe one of you techie types can tell me, but their sensor was different before. And so Canon cameras had a... a um, CMOS sensor. I forget what the what the Nikon sensors were. And I got a couple of old D, I got a D70 that used that type of sensor before they switched over to the CMOS. There was also a C40 before that, a D40, I'm sorry. So in order for you to then get a printer, Canon wanted you to, let me let me rephrase that. A Nikon camera had the older sensor, which didn't really come up to par with the Canon CMOS sensor. So Canon wanted people to buy their camera rather than a Nikon or Nikon. And so they offered you a free printer. That's what I remember to this day. That's how I was able to acquire three Pro 100s. I bought them for 100 bucks each locally here on Craigslist. And these came from people who bought a camera and were just given a free printer with a free box of paper. They had no, no wish to ever print anything. They did not. They didn't care at all about printing. So they put their printers up to, for grabs on Craigslist, which, of course, I went ahead and grabbed one, and then two, and then three. So that's it. 
Does that mean there's going to be rebates? I highly doubt it. That's why right now you barely, barely ever find any rebates on those printers. Let me go ahead and close this. Welcome. Um, before I forget to do it. And I'm going to load the next piece of graphics that I have here. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Just want to have it ready. All right. Let's say howdy to everybody. Peter is here from Copenhagen. Uh, Bernhard Moore from Southington, Connecticut. Pivotal Press. And he says, hello, Jose. Let me go ahead and post these as I go along. He's from Texas. Third Eye View is here. He's also a drone flyer. So welcome. Bernhard says, Spain is using drones to monitor beach crowding. Well, yeah, uh, that's probably not the only country either. Don't know how legal that is, um, but, you know, I'm not here to argue either side. I got to stay neutral with that one. Sebastian Kloon from Germany. My wife is from the Black Forest region. That's where her people came from. Mine came from Spain about, and like 12 other countries. Yeah. She's German and Cornish. Charles Berbrugen is here from Antwerp. And Charles, okay, again. Jeff Thompson, Louisiana. Or Louisiana, yes. E. Marsri or Marsri from the UK. Welcome. I'm, I'm recognizing a few people that I have never uh, seen here before, so that's awesome. Chris Bell, the PC technician, is here. Hey, tell me what kind of sensor the uh, Nikons used to use. You should know that. Michael McLean from the foothills of the Alaska Range. Oh, God. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful country up there, but a little too chilly for me, man. Just a bit. Luke Poe from Montreal, Canada. Let's talk horizontal banding. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a second, my friend. James Paula, hello from St. Augustine, Florida, and he's using a Pro 10. Love that place. Next time I go to Florida with uh, Disney being sort of in a weird situation, because that's, as you can see, that's all we do when we go to Florida, besides visiting my family members down there. Um, yeah, we're going to go to St. Augustine. I told my wife, uh, let's go there. Let's spend the night and see everything, because half the time we go, it's always with other people who are always in a hurry, and you don't get a chance to see anything. Okay, Shro Evers Photography. I got it. I think I got it. Congratulations. I don't know for what, but thank you anyway. Uh, we're doing really well on the YouTube channel, 33,000, almost 33,500, almost. In a couple of days, we'll, we'll exceed that. Eddie Lagos, does pigment-based ink last longer than dye-based ink? Absolutely does. We're going to go back and, st and and go over some of these, uh, including the banding issue. Charles Calderon, Herman. Where did I get Charles from? Herman Calderon from Los Angeles, starring, starting with a XP 15,000. That is the expression 15,000 model. I'm not too familiar with that one, my friend, but um, the problem that I have heard with that one is that I don't think it's being supported at this point with like a refillable system with auto reset chips and that sort of thing. They may come up with single use chips. I haven't really kept track on that because it's just not a priority for me at this time. But yeah, um, great printer is just not going to give you many options for um, third party products. Harold Goldberg from sunny Richmond. It was beautiful here as well. He's got a Pro 100. Today was gorgeous. The sky was fantastic looking. I should have flown today and taken some uh, shots with my Anafi looking up at the sky. 
Um, bad, bad thunderstorms last night, but uh, they went through rather quickly. 1066 Internet from Hastings, the UK. Glad to have you once again. Some of you guys know who the regulars are. Eddie Lagos is from California, Canon Pro 100. We have 51 people already here. Wow, amazing. Don't forget to smash that like button. It's a little thumbs up. Just click on it. Click on it. That helps us a lot. I have noticed a difference on the so-called, um, what do they call that? You know what I mean. Uh, on the uh, channel, when you go look at all the stats. All right, David John Martin from Plymouth, UK, Canon Pro 10S, Spike 597, Madison, Wisconsin, Angelo Govico from Honolulu. Chris Bell says, "Then yeah, CCD, that's it. Thank you. I knew you would charge a couple of devices. Yeah. And, it, you know, it was, it was good in that, it had its pros, but apparently the CMOS just ended up being the best. And so Nikon switched to that. And that's why uh, before that switch took place, that's when those Pro 100s were being given away, literally. All you had to do was spend like $700 on a Nikon, on a, on a Canon DSLR, and you would receive a free printer along with that. And a lot of these people had no reason to have that printer. Why even update that line of printers? Are they running out of parts, licensing stuff expiring? I have no clue. We're going to have to wait till the 9th of July to find out just what it is that they are offering. It's going to be interesting. It better be incredible. By the way, before we get any farther, I am drinking Malta India, which is a malt, not a liquor, is absolutely alcohol-free. A malt drink. I actually grew up with this stuff when I was a little kid. Um, it's rather high in calories, but again, who cares? You know, mm. it's an acquired taste, one that I have known all my life. We were at the store the other day, and I, my eye caught those. I was gonna buy some nice bubbly, uh, you know, orange mango or whatever. No, then I saw this. And I grabbed it. So I'm going to sip on that all evening here. Eddie Lago says, I used to have a Nikon D50. Yeah, I got a, I got a D70, a D90, and now the D3300, which is the one that I've been using locally. Again, they're not that great. But you know what? In the right hands, and I'm not bragging or anything like that, but you know what I mean. A... Relatively good camera on the right hands can produce masterpieces. You really don't need top of the line anything to, you know, come up with something that will, you know, will just uh, put people in awe. In other words, it's like drones. You don't need a $2,000 DJI Mavic 2 Pro. I can show you some stuff with my Anafi $500 drone that you will not be able to tell the difference. So, you know, it just depends on the pilot in that case, and of course, depends on the photographer. And that happened, you know, way back, even when I was doing film. Yeah, it was rather noisy compared to the Canon CMOS, of course. And, you know, there was also some power usage. I think the CMOS um, required a lot less power, and it was actually like a faster, data writing or saving i don't know i am no expert you are yeah so i mean that's there, there is a reason why the switch was made but let's stay away from cameras at this point we're we're about printers here so i mean the cameras create the images for us but we're going to talk printers for the time being yeah okay Roger Jones from Portland, Oregon, and it's raining today. Isn't it raining just about every day over there? That's who I was in the area of the region of Belgium where I was stationed there. Um, we used to call it liquid sunshine. And so it, it was constantly 
cloudy, kind of rainy, drizzly, great for growing vegetables and everything. I had an amazing two huge plots in my backyard. And when the sun came out, everybody came out. Everybody came out to enjoy the sun. I was driving one time from the Netherlands, and as I was going through Belgium, I went from beautiful sunny in the Netherlands. Uh, we went to Antwerp um, and came down, and it was like, you know, gorgeous, 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 slightly cloudy, oh boy, cloudy when I arrived home. So it was a joke. We used to call it liquid sunshine. I think I missed what Roger was saying. Nikon had a CCD and they made their own sensor at that time. Yeah. Anyway, enough about sensors. Let's let's go ahead and drop that subject. I just wanted to know what it was called because I totally forgot. Okay, Andrew Mantovani, the second. Hello, Jose from the Bronx. Thanks for all your great information. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Bad habit. I'm always biting my little hangnails and stuff. All right. Everybody's saying hello to each other. UK, it is raining. Yes. Okay. Well, again, you would not want to be here yesterday. It was nuts. What camera settings are you using for the Pro 100 when you are doing it? Uh, are you using matte canvas or glossy? Well, for the Pro 100, I would suggest you use a glossy canvas or a luster type canvas, and you can find those. They're very good. They print wonderfully on the Pro 100. Loading can be an issue, but other than that, uh, you know, it'll print just great. Um, I just re speaking of canvas, I just recently finished my roll, my sample roll that I got from Breathing Color. It's called Live L Y V E Canvas, and it is a matte surface canvas although i believe they also have a a um, glossy or luster canvas and i finally found their profile and let me tell you i know that you guys may have seen my video where i was actually demonstrating the use of that canvas i just finished the beginning of my project i'm going to go ahead and this is of course canvas as you can see very flexible but this is my my image that I have been trying to push all of this time. Some of you may actually own a print. Um, simply put, it is an outdoor cafe in our state's capital, Annapolis. And I turned it into a painting. And if you guys go look at my last video, the one that I uploaded yesterday, actually was published yesterday, uh, using Q Image Ultimate, and showing one of the features that I absolutely love, which is the ability to save a job with every aspect of the job, layout, print size, paper size, image cropping, you name it, printer, settings, whether you let the driver control color, where you let, you know, Q image control color, it automatically turns off driver control. When you do that, by the way, it's just like a Mac, except in Windows. And then you save it and you call it Jose's job. You know, uh, what's today? 628-2020. And then five years from now, assuming I still have that same printer, hopefully, I can go back and, and just open up that job. And as, as long as my files that I use, whether they were in separate drives, separate folders, it doesn't really matter. But the whole job will be reloaded. So I demonstrated that. It's just one of the features I absolutely just love. It's worth that alone, for that reason alone. So um, that job is saved. I can go back. I can open up that same image. Okay, as long as I have that drive connected to my computer, and it will pull it. It will then apply the profile that I downloaded from, from Breathing Color. I finally found it. And yeah, it makes a world of a difference. The print that I did with the uh, Epson canvas profile basically came out a tad too dark. Okay, this one is just perfect. I can see every detail on the shadow areas of the fake painting because I took the image and transformed it into a oil painting per se. And then, of course, printed on canvas. There you go. 
So now the next step is going to be for me to adhere that to a piece of 16 by 20 masonite. Okay, I will trim the edges. I will adhere it. And it's actually slightly bigger than a, than a 16 by 20 piece of masonite would be. Then I'm going to razor cut the edges flush. Then I'm going to apply coats of this varnish. I got the little rollers upstairs. They came in the other day. We're going to create a little masterpiece here. And then I'm going to buy me a really nice fine frame. One that would be suitable for, you know, uh, mounting a oil painting. The old fashioned, you know, canvas stretched oil paintings. Except this is going to be mounted on masonite. Simply just like a, a canvas board would be. In, which is what I always used when I was a kid, when I was painting with oils. So anyway, that's going to be uh, probably done next week. I will do a little demo, show you what I did, how I went about doing it, and so on, and then show you the final results. It'll be done on the other room, so you get a much better quality video. And again, um, I ran out of it, so now I have loaded my vinyl material from Breathing Colors, and... Guess what? It is compatible with water-based inks. There you go. I do not require solvent inks for this type of media. We'll test that and see what we get. We'll do some graphics. We'll do some, you know, small little um, high-resolution images. And, you know, that it's really suitable for graphics and that type of thing. A lot of text, a lot of uh, graphical shapes logos that kind of thing so we'll go ahead and try even a photo and see how that comes out we'll be using q image for that because i can just load you know image after image after image and you know little ones big ones middle size whatever it'll all be arranged perfectly to take advantage of all of the real estate of a particular size print all righty All right, so to go back to your question, Sebastian, um, Canon Pro 100, glossy or luster type canvas works beautifully. Matte canvas, like the one that I just showed you, no, that requires the use of a matte black ink, and it has to be pigment-based. Uh, you, you can get fairly good results. They're just going to be a little bit dull. Your blacks are just not going to be as deep as you might expect them to be. Okay, so you may not be... Um, very happy with the results. You might be disappointed. All righty. Chris Felicia. Uh, or Felicia, I'm grateful that you put me in a link in every video you do. Thank you a million. I saw the Canon PFI. Oh, I know who you are. Okay, drum roll, everybody. Okay, this gentleman is the guy that you go to. And I went ahead and put mine back for especially you Pro 1000 owners who are refilling. Get those 700 milliliter cartridges. And if you're here in the States, again, the best bargain you will ever, ever get. Because you will be able to print with OEM inks. Now, let me, let me just put it this way. Um... And now I got two people that I'm going to have to put against each other here. We got Chris, who's the original source of these cartridges. And then you got Precision Colors, who buys these cartridges from Chris, probably by the dozens. And then he bottles the ink and sells it to you guys for the Pro 1000, if you guys choose to go completely OEM. Well, you can get the ink from either source, okay? It doesn't make a difference. If you get it from Chris, it's something like 225 and free shipping to the US. I haven't gone back to look at your site for quite a while, but I do have your link on my description so that people can then just go to you and order. I have purchased a few cartridges from you, the very important ones, which are yellow, blue, red, okay? The magenta and the magenta and, and um, light magenta or photo magenta, the cyan and photo cyan are actually really, really good in the precision color signature edition. Okay, they really come up to par. It's just the blue, red, and yellow that 
just he could not get the third party equivalents to come up to that level. So he is making everybody basically, you know, they have to buy when you buy the set, you're going to get OEM yellow, OEM red, OEM blue, and I think chroma optimizer as well. Any third party chroma optimizer is like second class compared to Canon chroma optimizer. So I highly behoove you to buy chroma optimizer. You're going to use a lot of it. If you're printing glossy, luster, semi-gloss, satin, anything that has a slight shine to a super shine, you're going to need chroma optimizer. So you might as well get yourself a tank, in other words, a cartridge of 700 milliliters because you're going to go through it like water, okay? And that's, that's the truth. All righty. Thanks for hopping in here, Chris. Glad to have you. Luke Poe says, how to go over 10 years of life with an Epson 3880? Are you asking me or are you telling me that you have achieved that? Um, use it regularly. Uh, don't abuse it. Keep it nice and clean. Service it every, every couple of months or so. And it should last you a long time. Don't keep it in a super dry place. Don't keep it in a super hot, humid place. You know, average. If you're comfortable where you are, your printer will probably be comfortable as well. Okay? Let's talk banding because, well, not yet. Not yet. We got to, I just saw some people here just jump in. And Chris says, uh, first time live video. So, Chris, let me ask you this and see if you're willing to do this. Um, would you would you mind being a guest one of these weekends? You need a camera and a microphone, okay? And I provide you with a link, and you just jump in. If you do any kind of any kind of um, like right now, everybody is doing all of this uh, uh, Zoom and global communication, or or what do they call it, virtual communication on the computer with your kids and your family, you should be able to join us. And then we can just talk about how you came about, you know, doing what you're doing now. And it'll be interesting for everybody because everybody wants to know, how does this guy get this, um, you know, have a source of OEM cartridges, okay? Yeah, it, it is interesting. And you can tell us about your background, what did you do before this and so on. It will be interesting for everybody. All righty. Just a thought. Herman Calderon. By the way, folks, it is Herman, okay? Not German. Herman Calderon. Refillable cartridges on the way with chipless firmware already installed on the XP1500. Awesome. There you go. I knew something would come up. I knew something would come up. Awesome. Drone worship, watching your bebop playlist as we speak. All righty, ha <laughs> ha, awesome man. I got. You should see. Uh, you need to see the Anafi videos with my grandson flying them. And he's that little sucker is only eight years old. Okay, he flew the bebop. He flew the Anafi. He's a little rough yet, you know. But hey, those birds are so easy to fly. It's just a piece of cake for him. And he is loving it, loving it, loving it. Eddie Lago says, I just printed an image at 475 PPI from Photoshop. Did my Canon Pro 100 actually lay down? Okay, let me explain that to you. This is a confusion everybody, everybody experiences. Pixels per inch has nothing to do, okay? Remember, has nothing to do with dots per inch, okay? Pixels per inch pertains to the resolution of your image, which is what? Pixel base. So you will have a vertical resolution, horizontal resolution, X and Y. A square pixel gets sent to the printer, okay? Just imagine, nothing but one little square pixel in your image, and that gets sent, that gets sent to your printer. The driver, if it's a Canon printer, will adjust your original pixels per inch, whatever they may be, 
so that it becomes 300 pixels per inch, whether it has to up res or down res, okay? An Epson printer will take your image and turn it into 360 pixels per inch, okay? Whether it was 435 or, or you know, 298 per inch, it will turn it into a 360. 300 for Canon, 360 for Epson. Is Epson better? No, you will not see the difference, I'm telling you. Now, the printer will take one pixel and either print it with maybe one or two or three or four large dots because printers have variable droplet size technology from like 1.5 picoliter droplet size to eight. Okay, those are some pretty big drops. If you have an area that is pure red with no graduations of tone, it's just one tone it will use a large drop. It doesn't need to create thousands of little tiny drops when large drops will produce the same results. Okay, on areas of detail, it will use variables droplet size to be able to create those fine details that you want. So one pixel may require maybe four dots or it may require 16 dots of ink, depending what color that pixel happens to be, what density value it has, and how many colors do you have in your printer? Most printers, no more than nine. Epson, you know, um, Epson P800, nine colors. You're using actually eight. The newer versions will have 10, okay. But you're using really, you really using, you know, nine colors because one of the blacks will not be used. It's either matte black or, or photo black. So you get what I mean. Pro 1000, 11 colors. Yeah, you have 12, but you will use 11 because again, it's either matte black or photo black. So you cannot use both blacks. So it will have to take your very, very small number of colors and then mix the little tiny dots, as many as it requires to create one single pixel, little dot on your on your print. One dot may, may, may need 16 droplets of ink. So do not confuse, and I don't mean to be mean or anything like that, or being a smart ass and, you know, I know every, no. DPI, dots per inch, that is printer resolution. That's the value that you see when you choose a different quality. Okay, it's the number of dots that will be laid down to create one pixel, two pixels, 100 pixels, 1,000 pixels, 4,000 pixels, whatever whatever the pixel resolution of the image. It's always going to be either 300 per inch for a Canon or 360 per inch if it's Epson, okay? The driver does that. QImage does an even better job. It actually does it before it sends it to the driver, you see? So the driver doesn't have to struggle with figuring out how the algorithm should, should you know, create or destroy some unneeded pixels. Because if you have an overabundance of pixels exceeding 360 or 300, it's going to bring it down to that proper so-called optical resolution of the printer. No, native resolution of the printer. So the Canon wants 300, and the Epson wants 360 per inch. But that has nothing to do with the number of dots. Okay, nothing to do. DPI, use the term correctly. Dots per inch. Pixels per inch. Pixels per inch is from the camera. Dots per inch is from the printer. Okay? It could be very few dots per inch or a lot of dots per inch. It has no it has no, no difference on the number of pixels that make up a certain image element. Okay? All right? I hope that's clear. It's a little confusing. It took me a while to get it years ago when I was going through all of this, just like you all are now. It took me forever to learn this. But again, so to answer your question, after I long-winded myself to death here, yeah, the Canon Pro 100 will lay whatever resolution. It's either going to be 300, 600, 1200. That's it. Or what is it? Uh, 2400. And that's not really 2400 dots. It's actually laying dots on top of other existing previously printed dots. Okay, it cannot just by raw printing create 
2,400 dots, but it's always in that type of sequence. 300, actually 180, 300, no, 150, 300, 600, 1,200, 2,400. And when you get to 2,400, that highest resolution, it's actually going to overlay dots where the paper's going to advance very little, and it's going to it's going to print over those previously laid down dots, even more tiny dots, and more tiny dots, and more tiny dots, until it reaches an approximate resolution of 2,400 dots per linear inch or, or square inch of print. It's difficult. Don't worry about that. Just load your images. You don't have to pre-size them. You don't have to pre-do anything. Either the driver will do it for you, or if you use QImage, it will be done before it even goes to the driver, which is what I prefer and why I use it. We're not going to forget about banding, okay? Don't, 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 don't remind me to not go off on some tangent and not, not cover this banding business. And Rusty Nelson Photography, he is out storm chasing in the gallery. He's back, I'm sorry, back from storm chasing in the gallery at Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. He's got an Evo 2 Pro, which is a drone, by the way, with an incredible camera. Uh, Pro 1000 and a Pro... 4,000. I hate that guy. I tell you. No, I love you. Love you to death, man. Drone worship. Most of us in CMOS for FPV drone because it allows us to run a faster connection almost in instantaneously. Uh, what you see is what you get. However, the quality is degraded. David John Martin, I have gone over to Olympus from Nikon, not for quality, but size and weight. I think I opened up a Pandora's box. We got to talking about cameras now, and I really don't want to go down that, that road. Uh, let's stick with printers, folks. I have done over Olympus. Yeah, okay. I think you posted that twice. Angelo Govico. Epson News, the P400 is now discontinued, and it does not look like a new printer using HG2 ink set with gloss uh, optimizer will be produced in the near future. The 700 is advertised as a as its replacement on Epson's page. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Actually, you know, mm, that's sad to hear. I like that family of printers. I really do. I have an R2000, which is the predecessor to the P400. I got ink coming out of my armpits. Yeah. I wasn't going to say the other word. Um, because I was able to buy cheap OEM ink, complete sets as slow as 10 bucks, because that particular model was being used for DTG, for printing on T-shirts. So they convert the chassis to carry a special little carriage that can be loaded with a T-shirt and sent through, and then it uses vinyl, vinyl type inks to print. They needed lots of printers that way because the print has just basically uh, succumbed to the vinyl inks, and so they constantly have to be replaced. Yeah, expenses. I hope they're selling a ton of T-shirts. And so they had no use for all of these inks that they were pulling out of the brand new boxes of these print printers that they were basically just using to rip the printheads out of them. Yeah, imagine that. Uh, they have done that with a few other families of Epson printers. And those inks have been made available to the consumer at super, super low prices. Oh, boy. Actually, that, that printer you know, produce really great results. I need to revive mine. Mine has been sitting for quite a while. I got to load a set of inks and just connect it to my computer again and uh, get it going again. Uh, wonderful for color glossy prints. Man, not so good for black and white because, or monochrome because it lacked gray inks. It did have a no switch valve for your matte black and your photo black because it was eight colors and you had an eight channel print it so again no need to switch alex pritchard what 
the advantages of the right or X-ray color checker photo two over the data color spider checker? I have no idea. I, I would have to look at the design. I think they're probably both doing the same job. I, I can only speak for x right that when you use it on the job, actually on a location shot, um, you're going to then create a so-called profile for that camera lens and the lighting situation during that shoot. That profile then is created basically by scanning automatically the squares on that color checker passport card, or in this case, the spider checker. So what it does is going to look at the results, the image that you shot of that card will be reproduced probably incorrectly, okay? So the software will analyze each square and create a correction for each one of those squares. Now, if one is basically depicted perfectly correct, in other words, the values on the image matches the value on the card, then no correction is required. So it's going to look at everything and it's going to create a profile that you then load either in your raw converter in, in Photoshop or basically automatically in Lightroom. It's pretty cool. And then what you do is you open up your series of images on the, on the uh, so-called um, timeline and select them all and apply that profile to all of them. And you're going to see colors being corrected all along the line. It's truly amazing. That means that you will be able to then begin to edit with faithfully created images. In other words, those images are going to match the original colors because they use that standard, that card. I have one here. So here it is. Those colors are standard. Those are standard colors. They have to be correctly um, and faithfully reproduced. And that profile will get you as close as, as possible. That way, once you apply it to that whole shoot, as long as your lighting conditions didn't change, or you didn't change cameras, or you didn't change to another lens, yeah, that will have an effect. Well, it will. What it's doing, it is correcting for any kind of bias that the lens might introduce. Some lenses, they don't really project a perfectly neutral image. It might be it might be slightly off here and there, almost imperceptible, but it will correct for that. Now, the sensors, on the other hand, can impart some inaccuracies to some of these colors. So you're using this standard to create an image, and that image is going to be the source for the software to then create a profile, which will include all necessary corrections, okay? Whatever was off, it will correct that. That will be applied to your images. Boom, now they're perfect. Perfect. Now you can change your images whichever way you want. And uh, you can be assured that what you see on your screen without any kind of influence from you yet is about as perfect as you can possibly create. So that's why. Now, how different is X-Ray compared to, you know, Spider? All I can say is that x ray is the industry standard. Just like DJI drones are the industry standard, whether we like it or not. They're the, they're the, the big dog, okay? And so is x ray So is Adobe, okay? Yeah. All right. Roger Jones, proud owner of a P800. Hope you're enjoying it. I'm enjoying the hell out of it because it, you know, allows me to print on roll. And that's a luxury that you know, my 3880 just didn't give me, okay, or anything, anything, you know, before that. The Nikon, Nikon D90 12 megapixel was a great game changer for me. My son bought a Nikon D100 6 megapixel for its professional dentistry work. The D100 was in 2002. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you guys remember. Gosh, I, 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 I said I was going to talk cameras, but do you guys remember a Coolpix? It had a swivelable, a swivel lens. We had one of those at work. 3.3 megapixel. Woo! Man, we thought that was the bee's knee. 
Okay, Bernhard Moore, converting from CCD to CMOS required all new lenses after a new long hiatus. I recently bought a Nikon D500 to use my old lenses. Mostly I use my Android for photos. It's always in my pocket. Yeah, true. I've been shooting a lot of pictures with my phone. How did you turn your beautiful picture into painting? Some special program? Actually, no. In the olden days, and this is a quite an old image, Photoshop had a, a plugin called Artist. That's it. And it had oil painting. It had watercolor. It had pencil. It had all kinds. Of, I don't know what happened to it. They got rid of it. And so there are some standalone programs that you can use. I just don't remember what they were called. But yeah, it just requires software. But it does a beautiful job. Beautiful job. Is the Canon Pro 10 canvas setting using matte or photo black? It depends. It depends what you ask it to use. If it's matte canvas, you will probably have to use the fine art setting to trigger the use of uh, matte black ink. If you use uh, matte paper, it's just going to think you have common matte paper. It will use photo black instead of matte black anyway. So, yeah, not as good. So you need to use the fine art media setting and then choose canvas within it. And then it will trigger the use of matte black ink. Otherwise, it's just going to look kind of dull. Chris says, uh, yes, precision colors. He is great, too. I can work with people on overseas shipping. Look for my email from me soon. All right. Awesome. Because I know you were only able to do uh, USA shipments at, at you know the, the time where I was ordering a few cartridges from you. What is PG photo gray? Oh, yeah, I could, uh, definitely. I, absolutely. You have my address, I hope. I could definitely do a video on that because that's a a, uh, a grade that is very difficult to get otherwise, okay? Even though the third-party gray, that particular gray is actually quite good. Nathaniel Booth says, thanks for all you do. Do you teach a class in Annapolis? I wish. You know, my dream is to do seminars live. I really don't even know where to start. But that would be my dream, to just do a full weekend and just have, you know. All right, who the hell would organize something like that for me? Because I would need to have local hotels for people coming from out of state because it would be, a you know, like, you know, eight hours on a Saturday, eight hours on a Sunday. And I would need a projector. I would need a, you know, a laptop. I would need printers to be, you know, taken there for demonstrations, hands-on type of thing. Yeah, I would need us. I would need some help. This old man is getting to the point where he cannot do everything himself anymore. But that's always been my dream, man. Always been my dream. Sebastian says, you are right about Matt Canvas on my dye ink Pro 100 OEM ink. The blacks are a little bit dull. The colors are okay. Bought a cheap roll of Epson matte canvas for 22 euros. Yeah. Um, again, you know, if you just put up with it, it's fine. Um, if you add, if you coat it with a glossy varnish like this, it will it will immediately increase the, the D-Max look to it. In other words, your blacks, right now, this is untreated. And it, it might look quite dull to you at this point, but those blacks right here, they're really deep, okay? They were printed with the P800. I actually cannibalized inks from uh, sure color cartridges that were setup cartridges for one of the larger printers at the P20,000. Excuse me, I was able to um, land a set of full startup cartridges for the, uh, um, excuse me, for the uh, P20,000 for like $90. It was ridiculous. So I snatched that. I got it. I actually bid it, bid a lot more than I would have wanted to pay because I knew what it was worth. And people just kind of stopped bidding and I got it for 90 So I, I'm using that ink. It was 110 milliliters of ink, so I was able to load 
my refillable cartridges with with that ink and then i have like you know what 30 milliliters left so that's good but anyway yeah that ink allows me to print with oem on my p800 and remember folks i'm using refillable cartridges and the chip decoder board that was originally a long time ago offered i think no one is even buying that anymore um it just seems to be a very expensive option i don't know whether i'm going to even get my i got it for free i got it from an offer from uh, uh inkout.com so i was able to go ahead and test that and i did some videos on it for them unfortunately that's not their product they just sell it from china it took like three boards to finally get it to work yeah it requires a dismantling of the rear of the car of the printer disconnecting all kinds of cables from the motherboard and then bypassing the ink recognition system that's built into the printer and having the board take over that function it was a little bit of a pain but it now works and so far so good so even though i've been printing regularly i haven't even brought those ink levels down to and nowhere near where I would have to press the reset button. Yeah, we'll, we'll reach that point someday. Pro 1000, uh, current situation, I have about five cartridges that are now, color cartridges, that are now nearing empty. We will test that again to see if they reset or do not. I have single-use chips waiting on the aisles in case it, you know, it fails. And so, we again, it's a crapshoot. Um, with a Pro 1000 right now, the only option is those single-use chips and supposedly some newer chips that came out that claim they will work, auto-reset. They will work, including with the new firmware. Again, who believes any of that stuff? So, got an individual from Los Angeles who bought a set of those chips and he's right now using them so we hope to hear from him sometime in the future when it reaches that point where you know where the inks are declared empty and then you have to do the reset procedure and hopefully it will work if it works then i will spend 20 bucks a chip and buy some of those not cheap at all but if they work then that's the last time you have to buy them sebastian clune says okay i think i read that already 1066 internet 360 ppi times eight inks equals yeah well it, not necessarily it's not because of the eight inks okay um you could be printing with um you know less than that i mean it's going to uh well let's just let me backtrack if you're printing monochrome and you're using something like um, advanced black and white it's going to use mostly your blacks grays and a little bit of the yellow magenta hardly any of the cyan unless you're purposely toning your image but i think that makes sense okay it does to me the math the math doesn't lie but i think it's a lot deeper than just that okay um it's also the overlapping the quality settings you choose whatever yeah, it's, it can be a hair puller. Yeah, and I don't have any hair to pull. Tango Armin is here from Germany, I believe. Uh, hello, I'm improving my photography class via Zoom. I started them being impressed with your YouTube activities, giving useful information and a real human contact. Great answer to modern times. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you're doing okay and stay safe, my friend. I hope... Uh, this is over soon sometime. It's got to stop, okay? That's it. The Coolpix 9000 and 950 with the swivel lens camera. Those were great little cameras. You can put it like touching the ground, looking at a flower, and just tilt that lens. And you would see it. You would see the little screen right there. It was awesome. My boss loved it. He took it to China to an international meeting and dropped it and broke it. All right, Harold Goldberg, Corel makes a program called Painter. Painter is okay, but Painter is 
basically made for you to use one of these. Let me get it. This way. One of these uh, tablets. You use a stylus and you can paint. You can actually, they're pressure sensitive styluses. And you can actually create your own painting. I sh if I was that good, I would do it manually over overlaying over an image. You could do that. So a lot of people that do that. They put the original image, they overlay a, a layer blank, and they literally paint using these digital brushes and using a pressure sensitive tablet like I have. And but no, what I used was just automatically applied. You have some adjustments and parameters like the stroke sizes, the, the or resolution of the strokes. In other words, how how broad or how fine the little brush strokes would be, and so on. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, Nathaniel. Topaz. Okay, I'll look into that. I will look into that. Again, I think I think. Adobe just got tired of it and, you know, sold their rights to someone else. I did. I did use it. But you know what? Um, the, raw, the raw converter really does a good job, especially even inside uh, Lightroom. Tafawa Hicks. I'm sure, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. If not, please forgive me. Not sure exactly what the term OEM. It just means original equipment manufacturer. Okay. So basically the original products. Just like Mopar for car parts. Yeah. Manufacturer. What is it? Motor or something. I don't know. And, you know, you know what I mean. Original parts. In other words, they're not third party products. Yeah. Corel Painter is good. But it really helps if you have one of those one of those tablets. A lot of the artists uh, use them. John Longitano says he loves the streams and videos. Curious, would adding a humidifier to your printer room help keep printer cartridges moist? It's not the cartridges that need to be kept moist. It's not. The cartridges, they, nothing happens to them, okay? The only way you could dry a cartridge, you want to keep the print hit from drying. In other words, that, that bottom plate, where is my sample? Come to Papa, right here. This is where you want to keep moist and keep it from drying not the print not not the printer cartridges they're not going to dry unless you take a cartridge and lay it down with no clip and without the vent being uh sealed whether it's canon whether it's epson even if i take out an epson cartridge and just this has got ink in it okay and i just lay it for a year it's not going to dry it is the printer uh printhead nozzle plate that needs to be kept moist and really, think about this a second. When you stop printing, the printer moves over to the perch pad. Some people call it a perch pad, a parking station, whatever. It's where the printer print head rests. What it will do, it will slide over. It will remain afloat a little bit. It has been already wiped by the wiper blade, and I don't want to touch myself with it. And it will then rest against that perch unit or perch pad or parking station. The parking station will have a silicone style or based little peripheral gasket. It's like a little ring of, of this very pliable silicone. In this case, it will be zone basically into two zones. This will press against it. Once it is not being asked to print again for say 30 seconds or so, it'll press against it 
it is sealed. There's no way it's going to dry. Moisture, air, anything, dryness is not getting through the pump. That pump is a, is a sealed one-way situation. So once this print head seals against that gasket, it's going to be kept moist. Why does it still cause a, a clog? Tell you how. Because we never cleaned that gasket. And it starts getting crusty. It starts getting, while you're printing, that gasket is exposed to the air. The, the printhead is not going back over there. It's printing. It's just going back and forth. Da, 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 advance, advance, advance. Then when it is done, it goes over and parks. During that five-minute print job, or longer if you're printing on a roll printer, that gasket dried up a little bit. And it begins to kind of not perfectly seal anymore. You see? So it's not that the humidity is high or low. Of course, you don't want super high humidity or super low desert you know, style humidity. That will cause problems as you are printing, but not when the printer has rested and parked itself. In the old days, you had to power off the printer in order for it to park. Not now. That's why they used to have these auto shut off type things on your print. They still do. They're totally unnecessary. Only for those who they think they have to turn off their printer for whatever the reason. So, yeah. Moisture, really, it's not going to help you from, from so-called clogs. You need to, you still need to print. Okay. So the only way to stop clogging is to print. Okay. Don't try to circumvent the system by by coming up with you know all these other methods of preventing your printhead from drying. Printing is what prevents your printhead from drying. Okay. And also maintaining that gasket. And you can see it clearly. So how to get to the gasket on a Canon printer? Um, you can do it, you know, it's gonna waste some inks because of some of the in you know idiosyncrasies of Canon printers. But what you do is you power on the printer as the printer is checking itself. You know, it's gonna check whether there's anything on the far left that's going to block its travel path. It's gonna move from the locked position, it's going to unlock and move to the left. Pull the plug off the wall. Now you can slide that printhead over, okay? Or, or maybe on a Canon printer, see, they don't, they don't give you as much room as an Epson printer does. When you lift the lid off an Epson printer, you can see the perch pad right there. Canon printers, no. They sort of block that area. But what you need to do is a long Q-tip, you know, a long swab, a little bit of Windex, and just wipe that little rim, okay? Think of it as a, a, a little, I don't know, a little rectangular tray. And you take the top off and you got a rim on top. Just wipe that rim with that wet uh, swab. That's it. Every couple of months you do that. That will keep that gasket perfectly clean. If you don't do that, you will run into problems down the road because eventually enough gunk will build up where if you do get a clog, which you will, because now you're not sealing your print head, okay? It's not being sealed anymore. Nothing to do with your ambient, you know, humidity levels, okay? Nothing to do with that. It'll just dry because it's not being sealed, period. So you get a clog. You run a clean cycle, and you get no results. It's just not responding. You hear it working, but it's not really responding. What's going on? Well, first of all, it's not sealing. So how can it apply pressure or vacuum, in other words, to the printhead to suck ink out? That's what it's doing when, when you're cleaning your printhead using a cleaning cycle. This moves over to the perch pad. It sits, sits itself over tightly and vacuum is applied quietly. You don't hear that. You don't hear that at all. At all. Vacuum is applied. This detaches slightly, moves over to the left a little bit, and then you hear that pump kicking in, that whirling action and, and noise. That's what everybody associates with a cleaning cycle. That's when it's actually 
clean, clearing out the collected ink. But if you don't have a seal, you can apply all the vacuum you want and nothing will happen. So you, your cleaning cycle is totally ineffective. Why? Because the gasket is not sealing. Why? Because it's gunky, it's crusty, it cannot seal. It would be like trying to seal on top of sandpaper. You see what I mean? It has to be spanky clean, kept beautifully clean. And you do that every couple of months. Again, just start the printer up. Once the printer detaches, pull the plug. I want to go back to Ken. On Epson, nothing happens. When you put the plug back in, power the printer back on, nothing will happen. On a Canon printer, yeah, it'll run a clean cycle. Okay, so be aware of that. It will waste some ink. I've heard of people putting a wet sponge inside the printer. Please, no, you don't need to do any of that. Just print. Yeah. Can you refill the P800 using PC inks and their tanks and have the pre P800 reset itself? No. You can refill it. It will work the first time. For those of you who don't know or haven't heard me say this repeatedly, okay, it's been covered a lot, but I know there's a lot of new people here. So the P800... Uh, here in North America, North America, Canada, United States, and Mexico, it's locked. In other words, they have a special uh, firmware that prevents it from accepting the same chip, basically, is what it is. So I have a facsimile refillable Epson-style cartridge here. So it has a chip. That chip has one unique code. All colors have their own unique code. So the code for yellow will be different than the code for black, the code for magenta, the code for cyan, and all the other grays and light versions of magenta and cyan. So all of the codes will be different. Every time you buy a cartridge, OEM, original manufacturer's uh, ink, each color will have a unique code, a different code. So you buy five yellows, you will have five unique codes, different. The printer wants to see every time you exchange a unique, different code from the previous one. Outside of North America, the printer doesn't care. That particular firmware has not been locked. So you will then be able to reset this by simply removing it, fill it, put it back in. Once you reintroduce power to the chip, it resets the level up to full, not the ID code. The ID code remains the same, but the printer doesn't care. American printers, Canadian printers, and Mexican printers, in other words, all of North America, PA-100s do care. Okay, they don't want to see the same ID code for any given color, whether it has been reset or not. Okay, especially if the resetting, assuming it was successful, here's what happens. See, the printer remembers that, let's just say this is, this is photo black, remembers that when my photo black went empty, it was at the empty level and it had this code. And then I reset it and I put it back in. And now it seems, you know, it realizes, wait a minute, I have a cartridge here that it reads as full, but it couldn't possibly be because it's the same identical code it previously had. Okay, the code has not been changed. The code cannot be changed. It's read only. You can't write over it at all, okay? So you need an, a European or a 
you know, meant for Asia or Japan or any other country, but North America. Long explanation. I hope that clear all of the aspects. Now, your choices are these. Chipless solution firmware. It's a process. You're going to downgrade the existing firmware with a specific firmware that you're going to buy for about $70 that will render your printer as always full. Okay, it still requires the ID code of each color because it needs to recognize it so that it knows that, yeah, you do have a yellow cartridge installed or a light magenta restore or a regular magenta installed, vivid magenta, you know, any of the nine colors. It still needs that code, but it disregards it now. I mean, as far as seeing it constantly. And then the levels are just always shown full, always, regardless regardless of physical level actually in the cartridge. And that's a danger. You need to actually keep very, very close track of your physical levels of ink. The last thing you want is for this cartridge to go empty on you while it is still in the printer. And the printer thinks it's full, but you really have nothing but air in there. And now you have air in your ink lines. You don't want that. You don't want that headache. Believe me. So, what can you do in the U.S.? Well, buy a four hundred dollar decoder board and hope that you install it correctly, or install the chipless solution uh, firmware. ChiplessSolution.com. Just go there. One word: ChiplessSolution.com. So, solutions. I think it's plural. And install it correctly once it is installed your refillable cartridges will just from that point onward read full constantly check them every every month depending how often you print and keep them topped off these cartridges require that you prime them they require a priming session as you refill them you know from the beginning your virgin refill you have to prime it. Otherwise, no ink is going to come out. It can't until you prime that last little chamber with ink. And it's done with a syringe. So anyway, yeah. And then from that point on, you got to constantly, constantly monitor your ink levels. Pain in the neck? Sure. But you no longer have to worry about your, you know, P800 not um, recognizing your third-party inks. Yeah, at that point, you can use whatever inks you wish. Ink, you know, inkjet mall, pre PC, ink owl, uh, whatever, anything, any of the inks that are available out there. Sebastian Kloon says, I'm testing QMH1 for the last two weeks. Now I am on my second week's trial of the QMH Ultimate. One of these programs I will buy at the end. Yeah, it's wonderful. I would like to know if you guys are able to. Um, um, do that tonight. Um, if you would like me to continue with these uh, QMH tutorials, I have a few more um, features that I want to put out there and do a video on, uh, walk you through the steps and so on. But if you have something specific about QMH, and again, remember, yes, 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 the user interface is completely um, alien to anything we're used to. But then again, I have run into other photo editing programs that just put me to sleep, give me a headache because I'm used to, you know, Lightroom, I'm used to Photoshop, period. So any any other workflow, I would have to sit down and relearn. The same thing with video editing. I am a, you know, Adobe Premiere user. I know how to use Adobe Premiere. I've tried other editors and it's just, I, too many things I have to relearn because they're not following a specific workflow or a specific way to do your, your features of the program itself. Uh, it's all over the place, and you have to kind of relearn everything from scratch, and I just don't have the time to do that. So, but with QImage, you know, I, I, I do understand that it is a very unique interface. They've been at, at this for about 20 years now, so when they started out, that was the interface they had, and as they kept updating, updating, they never really changed it. They recently changed it somewhere in 2019. It became a little bit more refined, but it's still completely different than anything else out there. So it's something you have to learn from the ground up. 
But once you learn it, you're going to love it. Yeah, U.S. brand P800, you have to have some other option like the ones that I mentioned. Oh, wait a minute. Jonathan Raul. Raul. Uh, I print a lot of dark photo images on Strath. More matte inkjet cards. All right. Hope they hope they are printing well for you. I am using a pre-scored um, type of um, card media. I use Red Rivers. This particular one is... Aurora Art White, which is a beautiful fine art paper. It is pretty scored. You just immediately fold it, and you just can print in the back or in the front. Uh, I create my own templates, and I'm able to um, just drop images right on the template and load the cartridge, the cartridge, the cards, and print them. And I can do that on the Pro 100, on the Pro 1000, the P800, whatever printer I, I want to print on. Uh, some printers, we be aware that some larger format printers, I believe they have a minimum size stock that you can actually feed through them. Do you generate your own printer color profiles and which device do you use? Yes, I do. So I'm using right now a X-Rite i1 Pro 2. This is about 1500 bucks, by the way. So... That's what I am using. You have a calibration unit right here, which calibrates the internal light source before all jobs. And so, yeah, that's what I use and uh, works beautifully. I can do incredibly accurate profiles that actually have a larger gamut volume than even the OEM profiles that you download from paper manufacturers, including Epson, Canon, and anyone else. I could I could make one from my own printer model, you know, individual model, because printers are mass produced and so they're not gonna output identically, okay? That's why the Pro Series, the newer Pro Series of Canon printers have built-in densitometers so that you can recalibrate the output. In other words, all Pro 1000s, once they are calibrated with say Pro Luster paper, will output I mean, practically identical, okay? Otherwise, they will not. They will not. You would need individual profiles for each one. Yeah, it's a deep subject. One that we will save for some other some other time. Dennis Bader, Parksville, British Columbia, Canada, P6000. That's a big monster. Wow. Is that... Um, what width is that, like 60-something? I calibrate my models to improve match with the Canon Pro 10. Um, yeah, that's another subject with a lot of disagreement between many people. Um, I have my way of doing this. Other people have another way of doing it. Um, I get a match. Okay, and it's really simple. Once you calibrate your monitor and it is calibrated neutrally into the correct luminosity or density level. Remember, it's backlit. It's always going to be brighter than, than paper could possibly be. A print will never be as bright as your monitor. Okay, So you really have to throttle back the brightness, but you cannot do that simply by using those little buttons. You got to use a calibrator and use CDM2 to bring it down. I use level 80, which is really a slow... I can go down to, I think, 60, but 80 is just about right. And every output of all my 13 printers match in intensity to my monitor. My monitor is currently displaying neutral. Okay. It didn't appear that way initially. And I will ex explain this little, um, what, what's the word? Um, anyway, um, what happens is when you buy a monitor, it's going to be actually higher than D65. It will be. And so it's going to be sort of bluish, D70 maybe. So 
when you calibrate it down to the proper white point, your eyes immediately are going to see it as being slightly yellowish. It takes a little bit of time to get used to that, and eventually it will look neutral to you. D65 is daylight neutral uh, light, uh, so-called white point or, or color temperature. And then your output from your printer, by doing the, the, the certification that I have came up with, simply printing the standard image with a given printer that has been properly set up, 100% nozzle check, head alignment has been performed, you open your standard image, you print it, letting the driver control color using a paper intended for that particular printer and choosing that paper. You'll get an ICM match, if you will. And that output will, again, be neutral. Match it to your monitor. Does it match? Yeah, neutral, neutral. Oh, you're good to go. That's it. There's no magic to this. There's no, it's not that, you know, what is it? Um, space, you know, no. Science, you know what I mean, rocket science. You just got to match the two, that's all. And uh, I will recommend that you do not resort to adjusting, to post-adjusting your images. In other words, you edit them till they look good to you, and then you realize, oh, I have to add a little bit of blue. Why? No, you don't. No. Oh, I have to darken my, I have to lighten my, no. Absolutely not. I, you know, oh, I just took my temperature. Yeah, it says it's 98, but I got to add a degree because I know it's off. No, you don't do that. So, again, just, you know, get the two to match and you're good to go. The driver, no color adjustment from you. The driver controls color. The printer puts out a neutral result. It's not too light. It's not too dark. It looks correct to you. The standard image has a lot to offer. I'm going to do a video where I will go step by step each section of that standard image, and I will demonstrate to you what it is that is depicting, what is it that you should be looking for, okay? That's going to be a video that I'm going to put out maybe in the next couple of weeks. It's not going to be short, so keep that in mind. It's not going to be short. It's going to be detailed, boring as hell, but at the end, you will then know exactly why they made that image, why they created that image, and how it can help you with your printing, matching, monitor to print, okay? Let's finish up here, and then we're going to talk about banding. See, I did not forget. It seems like some BS that only North American models need third-party circumvention like this. Well, hey, that's the situation we are in. Take it to the Supreme Court. That's what we have to live with. I don't find that QMH interface confusing at all. Well, good. I'm glad. I don't either. I'm, I'm used to it. I remember when it was simple, a simple little tool to create picture packages, basically. And you could actually adjust them manually, and, you know, it was wonderful. And it still does that. It's just a hell of a lot more sophisticated now. Yeah. If all you're going to do is printing, that's all you need. You don't need Ultimate. I don't use 90% of Ultimate's features. I do not. Okay. I'll be frank with you. The reason I have it is because I am provided that program. Since I started to push it on my on my video channel, they saw fit to provide me with yearly subscriptions. So I appreciate that. And, you know, it's just a little, little bit of favor from them uh, for, you know, the publicity that I have given them. If I didn't like it, I wouldn't have pushed it. Simple as that. You know, Jose doesn't BS. Somebody told me that I should lie more about products. That way I would get more views. I laughed. <sighs> Delete. Yeah. 
Yes, please. The, with QImage, I use Capture One for raw development, which has a clever data management for pictures. How is this with QImage, including dependencies from jobs to pictures? Uh, don't know what you mean by that, but yeah, um, it's wonderful. Wonderful. Look at the um, look at my very last Q image video. I just put it up the other day, so that'll give you an idea. And I I just did a very simple, simple, simple demonstration. At a click of a button, actually, no one search, two click and press job and open. I think it's four clicks and a job containing, I don't know, 77 images cropped at different, you know, dimensions, um, laid out differently on a specific printer with these paper, this paper and those settings that you did a year ago will be pulled up within a couple of seconds. Try doing that manually. Dennis Bader has to disagree with me on a learning a different piece of software. All you have to do is stop saying, well, Lightroom or whatever does it, does it this way. Just accept the difference. Well, okay, I have to agree with that. I have to agree with that. Um, you know, I'm not saying that, I, I didn't say that in a negative way about QImage. I actually love QImage. But yeah, if you're used to, um, look, if I want to learn a new software and I have the time to do so, then I will take the time to learn it. Absolutely, of course. When I started using Lightroom, all I knew was Photoshop, and I had to learn a new workflow. And then once I learned it, that's what I'm used to. That way I can be more efficient with that. So at this point, yeah, there's there's a lot more other um, applications out there that I could be using, sure. But you know what? I wouldn't be doing them justice if I didn't take the time to learn and I just don't have that time, okay? I'll just stick with what I have now close to mastered, okay? So I will stick with those. But again, I'm not saying that, of course, uh, I could not learn something if, we, if if I just simply applied myself. Of course I could. Yeah. I didn't, I, I don't think I meant it that way. But thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I use Color Monkey and I set my monitors pretty low, maybe 100. Yeah, I got. I have to go down to 80, and I'm in a I'm in a room with 160 watt bulb. I got a door that I keep shuttered all the all the while all the while, and then that uh, window, it really gets northern light, so very little lighting here, and I never work with my overhead light on even, so you can even you can't even read something under the conditions that I edit in. So. By editing in a darker room, your black shadows are actually so much more visible, okay? Really, they are. It's like watching a movie in the theater with the lights off and then the previews preceding the movie or those ads that you see from the movie theater. You know, you have about half lighting and everything kind of looks dull. Yeah, that's the kind of a reason why I edit in a darkened room. And if you go to many editing suites out there, I, I had the pleasure of going to a local one here in Washington, D.C. that did all of the conversions from the BBC, all shows that are being shown here. And, you know, the, the video format has to be changed. Uh, they did that in a very dark room. And it was the first time that I ever saw um, high definition screens, flat screens. I had never seen any of those. I was still working with a CRT screen at that time. It was shocking how dark the room was. Jonathan Rawl says, looking for ICC profile for Strathmore Matte Ink Jet Card. We'll look at Red River offering for sure. They do offer profiles. Yes, yes, sir. We have arrived at the end of the chat. 56 people here. I don't know if anyone's keeping track on the likes. We've been on for an hour and... 40 minutes, that's not counting the preview five minutes of music, letting you guys join us. So let's talk about banding. So what can cause banding? Banding is what? What it sounds like. You don't have, if you were to print a just a, 
a neutral or single color, whatever, um, just one tone on a piece of paper. And it could be dark, it could be middle, it could be light. And you start seeing what looks like horizontal, light and darker, light and darker. That's banding. It could be mechanically created or caused. It could be due to nozzles, some nozzles not firing. It could be due to the head alignment not being properly done. In other words, the paper advance rate does not match to the pixel, the amount of the width of the path of ink being laid down. Okay? So when those, any of those reasons, and it could be two reasons, two causes. It could be a transport problem as well. Somebody recently uh, showed me a picture containing a very dark area. They were printed on a specific type of matte canvas. And it did have this, this, you know, it was supposed to be overall black shade, a very dark shade, but it showed these areas that were like slightly darker and slightly lighter. I get that on my R3000 with certain images and certain papers. So it could be the media. That's very rare, but it could be the media, assuming everything else is perfect. So if it's if it's banding and it's very regular, distinct banding, okay, and it's not like a band that's light and a band that's dark, but a bunch of little lines that look a little bit lighter, maybe a different shade of color, do an also check. That's very likely to be due to clogged nozzles on one, two, or three or more channels. Maybe you haven't used your printer for a while and you never ran an also check before printing. So always, always do that. <clears throat> Your options are obvious. Nozzle check. Oh, uh oh, I see something. And run your cleaning cycle. And guess what you do next? Another nozzle check. So with the Pro 1000, I don't know if you can see this. This is a Pro 1, I'm sorry. So you have 12 channels, and those horizontal bands, do I have this oriented right? Nope. Those horizontal bands do not have any streaks or any missing lines. It's just a homogenous band of color. That means my Pro 1, whenever I ran this nozzle check, is printing out 100%. So banding that I might see is certainly not related to nozzles not firing it's got to be some other source now head alignment again that's oh also let me show you the pro 1000 nozzle check it's hard to see but those are little vertical and horizontal lines creating little crisscross pattern there is nothing missing anywhere and you see those vertical black bands they're all identical in color okay that's a perfect nozzle check so any banding I might be seeing in my Pro 1000 is not due to a channel or two or three, not having a 100% working nozzles, okay? So again, like I said, if, if you immediately see nozzles missing, run a clean cycle, nozzle check, and then compare the two. Oh, now it's firing at 100. I guarantee you when you print your next image, they will not be banding on you, okay? Now, what about head alignment? So... If you let me give you a very simple explanation. If you lay down a quarter inch wide band of dots, then the paper has to advance exactly a quarter inch plus one more line. In other words, a line is composed of nozzles. So it has to advance a quarter inch exactly so that the next band is actually perfectly aligned. No spaces between each pass, no overlapping between each pass. What would cause a space or overlapping? A mismatch advance rate, okay? That's, that's what the alignment is doing, is making sure that the advance rate matches the width of the set of dots applied. So if it's an inch, that's a big printhead. If it's an inch, then the paper would have to advance exactly one inch plus one nozzle so that it would be perfectly aligned. 
If it's less than one inch, then the next pass is going to overlap. The previous one, you're going to see a black, a dark, not black, but a darker band. If it's advancing more, you're going to have a blank little space between each pass, you see. And you see that a lot. I see a lot of people giving me a printout or something, and you see, oh, my God, when was the last time you cleaned that HP printer, sir, and or madam, you see? So I see that a lot. Anyway, so head alignment will take care of that particular mechanical cost, and that is a mechanical cost. Now, some papers are just slippery as hell. And even though they are created for inkjet printing, they don't necessarily work for all printers. Okay, some printers will have a massively strong transport system. Okay, very secure. Some printers just don't. Even though those papers are made available and they claim it will work on all of those printers, not necessarily. So you could have, especially at the beginning, okay, as the paper, let me get a real image here, real print. As the paper is beginning to enter from the top feeder, it's being pulled by the, the initial grab roller, basically pushes it in and feeds it. This paper is super stiff. Very difficult for it to make that bend, okay? So really, you should use this on the straight path. Not, not the top feeder. It's, again, very difficult to bend. So the front edge is very, very easily slip. It's able to slip a little bit. So is the rear, especially the rear, even worse than the front. As the paper is being fed, once it passes through the front set of little rollers, the ones that have the little star wheels, then you're pretty well secure. And it prints, 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 prints. But then... Somewhere around here, when you start losing, you know, the, the traction, if you will, that paper can literally slip. It can literally slip and it can advance a little bit more or a little bit less. The rate is not constant. You're going to get weird areas that are, you know, they look like they're undulating in density. And I think that's what happened with this particular case. Quality. So... Quality and also the unidirectional versus bidirectional printing. And what does that mean? Unidirectional means that the print head advances and lays down ink and it retracts, but it does not lay down any ink. The paper then travels forward. The print head passes over the paper again, lays down another path of ink, and then it returns without laying any ink. Bidirectional is like this. Paper advances, print. Paper advances, print. Paper advances, print. And so on. So you're printing twice as much in a given amount of time. Any errors, okay? Any errors in alignment will be increasingly more noticeable. noticeable. And so for, for the longest time, High quality, fine art printing folks out there always said and preached that you should use only unidirectional printing. But we are in such a hurry to get our printing jobs done that we choose bidirectional. Again, if you have unidirectional feeding and you at least, you know, either manually or optically, you know, done, done by the printer, auto head alignment, you would get a lot better quality because remember, the printhead is traveling in one direction. Those droplets are dropping, being spit out as the printhead is moving. Okay. Think about this. What happens if I take a water gun and I squirt and move? I'll get a streak, right? But if I'm able to fire little tiny dots, they will not cause a streak, but they will be a little bit sort of like a bullet type shape. It's not a round dot. It's sort of like a like a little streak. When you print bidirectional, you're creating streaks in two different directions. That could have an effect, okay, depending on your head alignment condition. And again, it's really weird, but that's another cause of possible head alignment problems or banding. Um, highest quality. That means that the paper will advance a minuscule amount of time per pass. 
minuscule amount of length, in other words, not time, length per pass. And that will tend to overlap those dots. Remember I said that dots are being overlapped and will smooth out any, any possibility of any discernible banding that may exist, okay? Inside the printer, there's also a strip of what looks like a transparent mylar type material. It's located behind the printhead and it is, passes literally through the printhead. Printhead itself, there's a sensor there that reads that. Those, those strips have vertical lines on them, like a micron apart. And that is like a location system for the printhead so that the printer knows exactly where the printhead is located anywhere along the starting position to the end position, far left and back. If you do a lot of, uh, okay, here we go, borderless printing and you create a lot of overspray internally because you print with the lid down, all of that over, overspray, that little cloud, microscopic droplets of ink that are being oversprayed because you got to print beyond the paper edges is floating inside. They begin to coat that. It gets to the point where possibly this is all, it's not going to happen 100% of the time, but possibly if dirty enough, it will begin to create some smudges here and there. And that those little lines can no longer be read by the sensor. You'll have positioning problems. Yeah. So a head alignment requires that the decoder board, the decoder strip, encoder, Encoder strip? I don't know what it's called right now. Okay. But you know what I mean. Uh, that little strip has to be spanky clean. And so if it's not spanky clean, then the head alignment will fail. Okay. Yeah. You can do it a thousand times and it's not going to truly align your printhead. That match your printhead amount of ink being laid to the exact amount that the paper is being transported forward toward you. In other words. Whew. Long hair subject, again, it's very technical. I leave that to the engineers and the techs that, that repair print heads, repair print printers. Banding is a multi, it can be caused by multiple um, reasons, causes, and also, you know, two or three causes at the same time. If you get really lucky and you get the perfect storm, uh, you'll have a hell of a time uh, trying to solve that. We got 41 likes, we got 52. We had a few more before that, so 45 now and only 10 more to go, peeps, to match the max viewer number of 55, I think we had before. Um, I don't know whether I should do this. Uh, is there anyone here with the capabilities to come on board? Say hi to me. I know that uh, Rusty was here a little earlier. Um, I offered this also to um, Chris. Here is the link. You can go ahead and, and, and click on that and go through the process. I'm gonna go ahead and describe a problem that a viewer had, but all you got to do is click on the link and then uh, it will take you to the steps and I'll, I'll see you coming on here and I could bring you in. You need to have YouTube uh, absolutely muted at this point and just use the um, what you will get, the interface that you will get by clicking on the StreamYard link, which is what I am using right now to broadcast. All right, let's look at this a second. So something that could happen with your Canon printer. We hope never happens, but this is very likely that at some point in your experience, you may encounter this. And it looks like this. This is a nozzle check that somebody sent me and I went ahead and printed it. What do you guys see? I'll wait a few seconds. Go ahead and uh, type in the chat what you see. I'm going to take a swig of this. I'm going to put it here so you can still see me. So go ahead and um, tell me what you think you see in this nozzle check. Don't be shy. What 
lack of PC and cyan colors. Okay. Something else. There's another one. Magenta, right? PM. Photo magenta. Cyan. PC. So what 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 printer do you think this is from? Look at the uh, colors represented there. Matte black. It's a Pro 100, right? No, Pro 10. Pro 10 printer. So this is very, very unlikely to be actual clog nozzles. It is not. This is what we, you know, commonly call a an electronic failure of the printhead, and that will always show up as a full fifty percent of the band gone, either gone or very, very light. But you see, perfectly divided. A real clog would have, you know, a couple of streaks here, maybe here, you know, just random, not the whole half of the band. This one. This one is lighter. Okay, so that's that's not a complete failure, but it is a failure. And it is nothing you could do about it at that point. This one is gone, okay, completely. Half of it is not printing. So that is what we call an electronic failure of the printhead. And what do you do? Well, you have to replace the printhead. Now, depending, you know, like I was saying earlier, Pro, Pro 100s were being given away for free by Canon if you just bought a camera. Pro 10 came out later and, you know, Nikon had already switched over to a CMOS sensor. So there was no need for that, you know, buy our Canon camera instead of a Nikon, you see. So they stopped giving those cameras, those printers away. So... Um, they became more scarce, and Pro 10s were never really offered with a huge uh, type of um, deal, like a you know a rebate or so. So, yeah, you may have paid several hundred dollars for you know Pro 10 at the very best price. A printer will cost you about one hundred and thirty dollars, okay, at least. And so this is not a cheap you know part you have to replace. You have to you know. Uh, spend quite a bit. A Pro 100 printed, hell, you got it for free, maybe. Uh, that'll cost you a hundred and something dollars as well. Even if you got it on a rebate later on, they started giving them uh, away. Basically, after a good rebate, you had free paper, and you may have paid fifty dollars net, a hundred dollars net price. You're gonna pay a hundred dollars for a printed. You might as well just buy a new printer at that point. Again, with the same deal, you may have to have your friend buy it from you because I think they only allowed one household at a time to do that. So anyway, yeah, once you see those problems like that, yeah, that's it. That printhead is fried. You need to replace it. How does it happen? I don't know. It just happens. It just happens. And the problem is this. It can be the printhead all of a sudden going bad or it could be the logic board or what we would normally call the motherboard causing that because of some problem. PC repairman here or technician could probably shed some light as to what that might be. But then again, I think he's a, he's a computer expert, maybe not you know, as far as printers, interiors or internals go. But anyway, if it's the motherboard that did that, there's no way that you would know who the culprit was, whether it was an innocent printhead just going bad, because they do every once in a while, or was it the motherboard causing that? Okay. So you innocently go to eBay and buy a new printhead, and you go to install it, and in a day or two, it's also bad because it was the motherboard's fault. And not the not originally the printhead's fault. The printhead can cause the same symptoms, but so can the motherboard. And that's what I have been told. Again, don't look at me like I'm, you know, 
the expert on this, but that's what I have been told from people who have actually experienced this. Installed a new printhead, brand new sealed, and it went bad again. Yep. One of the things that can happen. Yeah, so exactly. So no no power to that section of the of the head, basically. Electric connection problem. Yeah, it is. So, but I think it's um, you know, is it is it physically caused internally in the brain? Head? Remember, we have these contact points. That's how the printer talks, talks to the printer. So it could be that, but you know, you could you could do the basic uh, troubleshooting, um, put the printer to ink change position, remove all the cartridges, unlock the clamps, pull the print head out, wipe the back of the, those contacts with an alcohol pad, and put it back. Also, clean the printer's contacts as well and put it back. Install it and see if it works. If it does, you're good to go. If it doesn't, then the print head is uh, at this point fried. Um, what they have not been able to determine yet because some people replace the printhead and everything is fine. So that means it was at the printhead level. If they replace the printhead and it reoccurs again, then that's further down or upstream, whatever. You know what I mean. It was caused internally by the, um, the um, motherboard. Three colors with 50% nozzle failure. Well, yeah, the ones that had partial printing, the, the, the nozzles are fine, believe me. They're just not being activated. They're not being triggered. All right, let me see what Chris Bell says. Not into printer repairs, but of the main board is faulty. It will kill the new printed head too. Exactly what I said. Yeah, that's what will happen. All right, so... One of the many, 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 many questions I get is, you know, basic hints, how to choose a printer. Do we need to really discuss this tonight? I think so. I think we will. Um, I always tell people, well, you're going to buy a car. So what's the point of having a car other than just looking at it in your garage or driveway from point A to point B? And you want to do it in a certain level of comfort. You, have, you want to have certain features. So the same thing with a camera, the same thing with a printer, the same thing with any kind of power tool, anything. You want to have a certain degree of performance from that particular product. If it's a product that there are many choices to you know, choose from, then you want, to want, you want to get the one that fits your needs. So I would ask, well, how are, are you, you just into this to just experiment? Are you just curious? what a print looks like. You've never seen one because you're you're only say 20 year old and you've only been exposed to the digital world. Yeah, send your prints to the lab, send your images to the lab to be printed and then look at the print and then, and then think hard about, okay, do I really wanna get into this? Because, oh my God, there's so many pitfalls, so many things I also gotta buy to support this new habit. But boy, what a fun habit it is. So for those who are photographers, and I'm not going to say that I am one, you know, but I do, I do delve. So what is it you're looking for? What do you want to produce? Um, four by six is snapshots for an album. Then yeah, one of those, one of those office printers will serve you quite well. What if you want to do one of a kind type prints that you might sell? You might frame, put up on the wall, like that canvas that I'm going to uh, prep next week. Um, yeah, then you need to consider something a little bit more advanced. And you need to consider, like, what what medias am I going to print on? Is it just going to be 8x10 glossies a la Hollywood from 1930s, 40s, and 50s? You know what I mean. Then, you know, you don't need something so sophisticated. You need something that's a dye ink-based printer. Pro 100 would serve you perfectly well. And when you want to jump beyond 8 by 10 yeah, it will handle that as well, too. Okay. So what about if you want to print on some more exotic type 
papers, media, canvases. And they even have linen um, that's printable. And so, yeah, then you need to choose something more sophisticated, something that will give you um, the, the, the ability to print on those surfaces that just don't quite, yeah, they don't quite really would you would think you could print a photo on and what i'm trying to say is something with a heavy texture again like canvas some of the rough papers uh this paper's got a nice rough texture it's really nice um this particular one here has a look of of, of, a, of a wet print it's really amazing yeah, you have to then choose, well, do I want pigment or do I want dye? Supposedly pigment, you know, lasts so many times longer than dye ink prints do. Yeah, here and there, maybe maybe years ago, but not today. Today, you know, the Canon Pro 100, the Epson uh, printers that use dye ink, they last quite a bit, okay? Especially on really, really good paper that will not... Um, increase the rate of de degradation, okay? And certain paper components and some of the cheaper resin coated papers do increase the rate of degradation regardless how good your inks are. So you need to, you know, you need to consider that. Um, what size prints do I, do I dream of ever making? Am I gonna make panoramas uh, or never? Okay, so if you're never gonna make a panoramic, panoramic print, meaning something maybe, do I have one here? No, I have them in the other one. You know, 13 by 40 something. Then you, you know, if you're going to do that, you need a, a roll type printer or something that could at least allow you to use a roll. P800 is wonderful for that. P900, I'm sure, will also be wonderful for that. The Pro 1000? No, it's not. The Pro 1, Pro 10, no. So, capacity. Also, what is your volume of printing going to be? If you're not going to print often, don't get a Canon printer. Remember, cleaning cycles automatically forced on you, okay, to keep you from clogging your printer through lack of use. You might consider an Epson. The Epson will not impose those cleaning cycles on you, but it will clog. And you have to do the cleaning yourself. You see, so there's a lot, of, a lot of give and takes. Gamut: Are your images going to be super demanding, or are they going to be, you know, relatively low in resolution, more, more gentle, if you will? Uh, is your job as a photographer to do portraiture of babies? Then you really don't need huge gamut capabilities because babies are nice and pink and slightly brown. And, you know, you really don't need a huge gamut to reproduce with your, you know, with a 12 color printer or such, you know, a, a nine color printer will suffice perfectly. Um, again, so many things, it's all very subjective. And I always tell people that there's no way I can recommend anything for you. You got to tell me what you're looking for. Then I can sort of, Okay, this one will not do. That model will not do. This might be the one for you. So you got to do that yourself. This is something you have to answer yourself. What about papers? Oh, my God, there's so many papers. And how do you know? How do you know what will strike you? How do you know what will hit you in the heart and say, OMG, this one did. To me, it did. This paper just grabbed me. It's beautiful. It's amazing. What, what a difference from Pro Luster. Come on. No description could, you know, could, could you know, give it just the justice it needs. This, this paper turned out beautifully on the Pro 100. Yeah. So there you go. Um, very difficult choice to make, but one that you should take uh, very, very careful steps and not jump just because there's a sale for this printer or not. There will always be sales for these printers. Just like they're, just like this weekend, is the, it's not the only time to buy a car. Just because they say there's a sale that you cannot pass up. Toyota, Honda, Ford, Chevy. No, come on. 
the sales will be there all the, every weekend, every weekend. Believe me, it's the same thing with printers. Don't 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 feel that you have to buy one like right now because this is the I cannot pass this up type offer. No baloney. Just be careful because then you end up with a printer that you will not be able to afford to use. Okay. And that's one situation you don't want to get into because, you know, that's it. That's the worst situation you could get in. Um, not to beat a dead horse. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 ba, ba, da, ba. Oh, here we got some more questions. Okay. And I got one last thing that I want to discuss. Jose, my 3880 is over eight years old. This is Luke Paul. Uh, when I bought it with my D7100, and I'm very reluctant to start again with new printers, all the problems that come trying to use third-party inks. Yeah. 3880. Man, what a workhorse. That thing is awesome. Easy to convert for DTG, direct to Garmin. Yeah, they've been using that. It's got a straight feed path. You can put, you know, like, I think 0.5 millimeters or 1.5 millimeter boards through the front feeder push it right in line it up it will print out again papers like this that are heavy and very inflexible or non-flexible can be fed through the front the r3000 has that function as well as most of the epson larger format printers allow you to do that 3880 is great i have one and uh I should use it more often, but I do have one, and it's great. If you use OEM cartridges all the time, again, that thing will last you forever, okay? It says 15,000 prints maximum, but not. You can go way beyond that. It's really meant for, you know, like daily printing and just a workhorse uh, of a printer. Wonderful. Chris Bell says, the reason... A lot of computer techs like myself avoid printer repairs. It's trying to get a hold of genuine parts for from Canon or Epson is high, nigh on impossible. You have to pay to become an authorized tech. Yeah. Um, I got a, there's about 40 miles north of me, there is a Canon service center, but it's not really, it's not really controlled by Canon. They just have technicians that know how to work on Canon printers. And um, yeah, I, I I I get you. I get you. Epson P nine hundred will not be out until mid or late July, or I would have gone with it. I'd like to thank you for the time and information. You helped me. You helped me more than you know. Well, awesome. I I love to hear things like that. Um, we will see what this printer brings. Um, there are a couple of people that have had their hands on them. Uh, there's a guy in, um, I think it's North, something like North Light Images in the UK. This guy uh, does uh, reviews and he gets privy to a lot of these new releases and so forth. I, I've heard stories about the quality being incredible. Okay, so... We will have to see. I may put up with the fact that there might not be a, you know, a, a source for a third party for that printer for probably forever. Angelo Govico. I'll give you one word answer to this. Is the gloss optimizer from Precision Colors reasonably comparable quality-wise to OEM glob? And my PC glob affect the color produced on prints the first answer is no and the second answer is also no the any any chrome optimizer gloss optimizer third party not even close to oem that is one of the that is one thing that i would absolutely always include oem Gloss optimizer as well as chrome optimizer for Canon printers. Um, they don't even smell the same. 
there's a certain ammonia-like smell of, of true, especially Epson uh, gloss optimizer. It's got this strange, slightly ammoniac, uh, um, ammonia smell to it. And it's a little, like, it's not perfectly transparent like the, I call it the fake third-party gloss optimizer. No, it's got a, it's a slight cloudiness per se, which would sort of strike you as funny, but no, it, it comes down on the paper perfectly clear, but it just, when you look at a bottle or, or if you extract some uh, chrome optimizer from so-called empty, like PG, PG29, PGI29 cartridges that I get, um, yeah, it's got a cloudy look to the, to the uh, solution. Um, the gloss that it lays down is, I mean, amazing. Any third party that I have used, no, is is kind of a, it slightly reduces gloss differential. It's not as good as the OEM. I highly recommend you get OEM. Now, I was able to get my hands on some German OCP gloss optimizer for Epson printers. That stuff smells like OEM. Yes, it does. And it is even cloudy. It's a little bit cloudy like OEM. So, unfortunately, that stuff is near impossible to get a hold of. I still have like half a liter of it. Anyway, so let's jump over to one more subject. It's 612, and we have 52, 51 people here. We've been on for about 2 hours and 17 minutes. So let me go ahead and I'm going to close down the uh, chart that I just showed you all. Get this last little picture here set up fully. Our goodbye. That's all set. Okay. Basic printing, basic printer problem troubleshooting. And I think we covered some of that already, but we'll go ahead and, and hit it. So um, many problems can occur while you're printing. And some of them are your fault, my fault, and the printer's fault. Or possibly, you know, something in your computer could cause problems. Um, recently, I had a really interesting um, consult with someone, and I got to do one, I think, tomorrow night. And that's why I invite you guys to join me here, because normally I charge 45 bucks for one hour, okay? And you could get a consult here for free. Simply join us on the panel. Click on that link, and you're good to go. And you can... We can possibly, okay, take care of that problem you may be experiencing. Might as well take advantage. On the live stream, it's always for free. Okay. So I don't have the image with me, but I'll give you, I'll give you an idea of what was going on. So the gentleman was getting perfect results till almost the end. At about this point right here, the image, which basically looked photographic, became nothing but streaks. Not streaks in this direction, but streaks in the opposite direction. Okay? It just became lines, weird lines. What could cause that? Well, nothing on the printer could cause that, period. It's not due to, oh, he says, I cleaned my head. I, I did nozzle checks. I did this. I useless you wasted your time you wasted your time when that happens it's like the image transmission from your computer to the driver just gets foobar okay and literally it goes from perfect image to nothing but lines like a like a like a, an old fashioned tv screen when it goes haywire that's what it looks like and you know what it was? Again, it has to do with data transfer. So think, think hard. What, what could cause that? What's the most direct way to send data to the driver and then through the printer? Anyone? By having a wired connection, either network or like most of us, USB. What happens often is that, yeah, bet he was on Wi-Fi. Here we go. Thank you. 
Thank you. See, that was the answer. And I thought, uh oh, I know what this is. Are you on Wi Fi by any chance? And I was very gentle at first, trying to, you know, ask him because, again, he did all sorts of unrelated things that had nothing to do with the problem. Clearly, that was a data transfer problem. Okay. It, it did it, did it, did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. Oh, I can't send this anymore. I'm done. <laughs> nothing but garble. Okay. And that's what it looks like. I told him, connect your printer via USB. He did that, problem gone. Is this a way forward due to, is, is the way forward due to parity checking in the Wi-Fi signal? Yeah, see, you de you describe it technically, I did not. I just told him it's your, it's your Wi-Fi, okay? And I don't care how good your Wi-Fi is. I never, ever connect any of my printers to Wi-Fi. The only time I did that is when I was printing text for my laptop to when I used to have, I used to have a uh, Epson Artisan 720 little tabletop model with a little scanner unit built into it. And that had Wi-Fi, but I was always right next to it, even though I had to go to my router down here and back upstairs, sure. But it never had problems like that. But I never really printed images with it how am I going to send a huge image via Wi-Fi, okay, and expect the printer to handle that? You know, no, it, it just couldn't. It just could not. Let me see here. Jeg569, I think you've been here before. Um, hi, Jose, watching from Scotland, enjoying tonight's video. My Epson P700 is printing great. I have just got into home developing my 35, ah, a medium format film. Talk about going down the rabbit hole. Yeah, well, um, get yourself a good scanner. Epson makes really good film scanners. Uh, I got the Epson Perfection V800 photo. It's a big unit sitting right here, and it has amazing negative scanning qualities, okay? So scan your negatives as high resolution as you possibly can and begin to enjoy life because this is a lot of fun p6 p700 huh? mm. can you share with us since we have we here have you here um once you set up the printer and you and you were able to to um prime the ink lines and the internal dampers in your printhead how much ink did you have left can you share that with us because the rumor is that you need to really go out and buy a new set of cartridges pretty much immediately. There you go. See, a lot of people will argue with me about that very same point. I said, stop arguing and just, just do it. Do what I just told you to do. You know, oh, but my printer is next door. Too bad. Run a longer cable. You can get by with almost 12 feet of, of USB cable with no problems. I do it all the time. Okay? And I'm sending big-ass prints, big-ass images to my printers next door. Okay? Everything is wired. All righty. So we were talking about, about you know, so-called um, troubleshooting. So that's that's that was one interesting uh, event, if you will. Now, the most common, the most common thing that happens is, of course, my prints don't match my monitor. We don't want to get into that. That's a color management problem. Let's just talk about troubleshooting actual problems that happen while you are printing. So, you did your your standard image. It came out perfect. So, why shouldn't your images come out perfect? This one did. Ah, your images are not perfect. This one is. Okay, that standard image is perfect. And your image your image was sent to the printer. The printer is working as, as designed, produced a neutral result, not too light, not too dark. That's all you want with enough gamut to give you a full, you know, um, rendition of all of the colors included in that, in that standard image, except for the strip of outer gamut colors. Don't forget. I'm going to discuss all of that point by point in that upcoming video. So keep an eye out for that. All right. So 
how about you did your standard image it was beautifully depicted on your favorite paper you went to bed happy you slept like a log and the next day you know you're still on lockdown so you came in to your room where you have your computer and you said now i'm going to print my images i'm going to go ahead and edit them and print them and they just they just they are just a disappointment to you okay so something happened between last night and now well that something is last night you printed with a perfectly designed image and this time you are printing with your own images from your own camera okay edit it because you did not edit that previous one you don't touch that image you open and print it open and print it never open edit no open print it and close it done now you're editing so now you get into that monitor being off out of the box you never touched it of course it's going to be slightly bluish of course it's going to be slightly brighter not slightly but a lot brighter than it should be so what happens well if it's actually neutral which it may not be then what's going to happen is that it's so damn bright that you're going to go ahead and edit down the brightness of your images now it looks perfect i print it guess what i guess what you sent i'm going to say i i don't do that anymore oh baloney <laughs> not true I just sent, you just sent a dark image to your printer. What choice did your printer have but to produce a dark print? See, then you come over and you put it next to your mouth. Oh, my God, this thing is like three times brighter than the print. Of course it is. The monitor is too bright. You cannot just adjust it manually. You have to use a calibrator because if you do that, it, all of the colors are not going to be linearly brought down to just a darker value. It's gonna be more like a curve. So it's gonna be non-linearly adjusted. You're gonna have colors now that are off, period. So it has to be done with a calibrator. Now, what if yesterday you're printing your images and they are really good, you're stoked, and you go away for the weekend, you come back Monday and you print something and the print that you made now is some other color. What happened? Something happened. Run a nozzle check. Don't waste your time printing. Run a nozzle check. If it's due to something not fully firing, you will see it. Cleaning cycle, nozzle check again. Put the two together before, after. Now it's perfect. Print that same image. I bet you it will be the same as you as it was the Friday before you went on your weekend getaway. See? So always run an also check. When you see a sudden change on color rendition, it used to be perfect. Now it is not. Nozzle check is what you need to run. Don't waste, don't waste ink unnecessarily. Printing again, hoping that printing somehow will solve that problem. Not on a Canon printer. Don't do that. It's harmful. Okay, you need to clear those nozzles first. All right. What about, let me think of something else. I got to get a drink. I had one in my head. And it just fled me. <laughs> that's, that's nothing new. It was a good one, too. Sorry. Let me go ahead and look at something else here. And again, this is one that always, always gets people. Always. Um, we'll, we'll, it'll come back. Um, Chris Bell, he's been very diligent looking at our um, likes and uh, view viewer ratio. We got 51 likes now. And we got 50 people at this point. We need to reach four more. But those people may have already fled. So let's see what we got here. Yeah. I always want to use the most 
effective way to communicate with my uh, printer. Remember the days, the old days of cordless telephones? You know, it wasn't perfect, was it? And uh, we still have a landline wired. We use cordless telephones, but, you know, we still use our landline. And then we always we also have smartphones, but I like to stick with something that is a little bit more reliable. Uh, how was I order a new set of inks? Not much ink left after the initial prim priming. I have not had the chance. I, ha I have not had to change them yet after 15 prints. Okay, that's good to hear because we wanted to know exactly. People are claiming that once, once you prime the system, that's it. You can only print a couple of test prints and maybe a few prints. By a few prints, I don't know what they meant by that. Possibly not 13 by 19s. So, you know, what size have you been printing with whatever is left? And... Um, how much was a set of cartridges? That I want to know uh, because then I can figure out what a cartridge will sell for. I would need to also know that about the P900 because the P900 is going to go from an 80 milliliter official uh, to a, a 50 milliliter, I think. And for those of you who may not know, the official 80 milliliter cartridges actually hold 90. There is always... 10 ml left okay when the cartridge runs empty by the chip reporting so yeah it is, it is quite interesting folks ah okay so let's let's go back let me see what we, what else we got here let's just read some of these comments Hi, Rumi's from St. John's, Newfoundland. I have been using a digital camera with a macro lens to scan negatives. Oh, wow. Uh, it's much faster, sharper, and has twice the di dynamic range of an Epson scanner. Okay. You got me beat then. Uh, I used to have a dedicated film scanner at work. That might be a good thing to do. I might have to uh, consider doing that. So are you using a um, light box of some sort? To light your negatives, that would be nice to uh, be able to get into again. I've been, oh, you've been printing 12 by 18s on my R3000 from the camera scans, IRR, and they are the nicest prints I've ever made. Wow. Now you're getting my. Uh, Taste buds stimulated here. Uh, MPM photo, evening, Jose. FYI, I have observed that my photo edits in my raw editor on one raw 2020 does do not update on the QIU file of the same image. The auto updates from PS and Lightroom work just fine. I don't know. I am not sure what you're referring to here. But yeah, um, I, I let me just give you my two cents. Um, I love I, I love Lightroom because whatever I do, it is just saved as as sort of like a history. It's not really affecting the original raw image, so it's all kind of metadata based, and I can go back and and actually go through any of the whether it's one edit step or a hundred edit steps to arrive at a final result. I can go back and access any of those steps. It remembers everything. I can I can crash the program, and I can reload it, and it goes back to the last point of my many 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 edit uh, steps. The six videos NJ printing with genuine pixels, channel one introduction by Maru. To me, it's very clear. Let us know what you think about them. I will go ahead and look at that. Yeah. I'm going to go back and look at I haven't seen any of the Maru videos since the P800 came out, since they were pushing their cartridges. Ah, okay. You made a live box. Awesome. Rod Levesque is here from Canada. And let's see. JPEG 569, 279 for the... Uh, that's, is that euros? Yeah, I don't know. 
with 10 individual tax, then no bulk is buying yet. Yeah, of course not. And I don't know whether they are going to um, lock their European uh, models or not. Hopefully not. If they do lock them, oh, that's UK pounds. Okay. I don't know. My, yeah. So if they do lock them, it's going to take the Chinese a bit of time to come up with a, with a system. Um, but if they don't, then it's going to be pretty simple to, at least for them to come up with some sort of auto reset type system. If they do lock ours, then you, we're screwed. Hmm. What about the 900? That's what I want to know because one of these cartridges sells for about $60 US here. So you would need nine of them. No, 10 for the 900. But they're going to be like, you know, 30, literally 30 milliliters less. Okay. Oh, Kiermich Ultimate. Okay, okay, okay. Gotcha. That's your workflow. Okay. I usually work in Lightroom and then export out to Kiermich Ultimate for printing. Remember, not it's not DPI, it's PPI. Not DPI. People misuse that term. A lot of people, including the experts. All righty. Try to remember what the heck I was going to talk about as far as a printer um, problem. Of, geez, I should have wrote them down. I thought I had it all memorized. Getting old. <laughs> so uh, next week, I just want to tell you guys, I don't have a guest yet. Um, again, if any of you guys want to join, just just get a hold of me. I'll give you my email. I don't pass that on too much. And then contact me, and we'll set up a, um, you know, before we go live, we can join each other, if you will, and we'll see ourselves. Um And we can set up audio, make sure that everything is okay, camera, and so forth. Here's my email. Feel free to contact me. Tool Joe. Oh, wrong. See that? Let me rewrite that. Because that I cannot delete my own post. Wow. 1949 at yahoo.com. Make sure that is correct. All right. There you go. So give me a, a um, call or uh, not a call, but you know what I mean. And um, we'll set you up. And again, this is going to be uh, the equivalent of a one-to-one -one on the phone, except we'll do it online. And that way I can, I, I'll, I'm, I'll make a few bucks out of it, of course, because the, the uh, stream is actually monetized. Um, once we are done, I have to set all that up to earn us a few bucks a month on the stream. So, all righty. Well, give you guys another chance. We're going to cut it, cut it short today. I think so. Um, so the plan is, of course, remember that in a couple of weeks, we will have Mike Lee from Precision Colors back again with us. And he's got a couple of things that he's, he's going to um, be talking about. So, again, usually we'll stay for about an hour with me. And then after that, I'll take over for the next two hours or hour and a half, whatever the case. Um, we, we go as, you know, with the flow, if you will. Um, let's see. Chris Bell just gave us some information. Uh, okay. So, what do you think the... Um, Oh, good. What do you think the cartridges might go for? Hmm? And also, I wonder, 
if they are going to be pressurized cartridges like these are. These have that internal bag that has to be internally pressurized to maintain that 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 working pressure as you print. So um, let's see. For the PA hundred, the hundred and thirty ML costs one hundred twenty USD. What do you mean one hundred and thirty ML? One hundred and thirty. No, the PA hundred does not use one hundred and thirty. It uses eighty. So about forty two for a. Yeah, boy, P900 cartridge, that, that's okay, I guess. That's okay, I suppose. Hmm. Okie dokie. I don't know what tomorrow's plans are. Oh, yeah, of course I know. I'm going to go pick up Nathan, bring him over to the house. He's going to play a uh, robot game, Robot Wars is called on my computer and probably on my phone as well. I got it in both both um, units. Anything else here? Let's see. Do, 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 do. 35 euros. Okay, here's a question. Wait. Okay. Do you need to flush the Pro 100 printhead when you switch to Pro Color Ink. What is Pro Color Ink? A brand? And no, if it's a brand of ink, then no, you don't have to. Um, uh, if you, let, let me just say, I think you mean the cartridges or the printhead. You don't flush anything. You don't flush the printhead. It just runs a cleaning cycle or a purge cycle, if you will, after you install anything new, it will run a purge cycle and the existing ink that was in the printer, whether it was OEM or some other brand, will be washed away into the internal ink pads. Yes, it's good. You're good. You're running on the new inks at that point. It's pretty much instant. If you mean uh, cartridges, that's, that's a different subject. I don't know. Maybe you can clarify what it was that you were asking so that I can then help you. If I had to replace a PA-100 right now, I would get another PA-100, not the 900. Well, uh, there, those people who do have it, uh, or the, the, the Pro, um, the P700, which has the same ink set, I assume, are saying that the results are really, really great. Um, better than the previous version? I have no clue. Again, it better it better really be good. Out here, they have Epson P series in ink. I don't, but those are not. Is that OEM? Those are not OEM. Are they? And where is out here? Um, I don't know what you were trying to tell. 1066 internet. Um, let me go back to this one. There is no 150. Can you link me to that? Or at least tell me where to search for it because there shouldn't be anything like that. It should, that would be, that would be some kind of compatible, uh, cartridge of some sort. Photo Supply Portland, Oregon. Yeah, that's a that's a third party ink, and it's probably Image Specialist anyway, which is or 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 SDS is the only inks that are available here in the U.S. They are all selling the same inks, basically. The only guy who's selling inks that are tweaked to match OEM as close as possible is Precision Colors. Period. He's using those same labs but they are actually creating custom blends for him. 
to meet his standards. 80 millimeter carts and ARC chips on our EU, EU version really swings it to the P800. Yeah, you bet. If you need to stay with that, and your only option is the P800, because I don't know what you know Epson's going to do with the P900. They're going to allow you know this kind of a product to be generated from China and sold to everyone else but the U.S. Probably, if at all. Lino PR. 2016 from Philly. All right. Okay, folks. Let me go ahead and prep myself to say goodbye. I'm getting hungry. I want some of that dinner that they prepared for my wife. And I, I think she's home. I heard her upstairs earlier. So let me go ahead and load up the goodbye little graphic here and i will go ahead and start the music please go ahead and say goodbye tell us if you enjoyed the live stream or not and uh, we hope to see you all next week i will post any new um comments directly on here so we'll see you next sunday and uh, hopefully i'll have some news from canon about what's coming up in the future but i don't think i don't think they're going to divulge that until the actual date where they will actually make the report And again, don't forget, if you guys want to go back and um, review this um, live stream at a later date, it will be available as a regular video, and you'll be able to watch it. You just won't be able to uh, interact with the chat. But uh, YouTube has made a change recently, the last several months, where the chat will be actually visible during a replay. So that's actually a good thing. Oh, yeah, the standard images are available in my Facebook group. We certainly will try. Stay healthy, everybody. All right. Thank you all so much. So much. See you next week.